This podcast contains sensitive material which includes murder and violence. It will not be suitable for all listeners. For a list of confidential support, please see our show notes for more details or visit our website. Listener's discretion is advised. On the 9th of February, 1963, 19-year-old John Button and 17-year-old Rosemary Anderson spent the day together before deciding they would buy fish and chips. The pair had not been together for long, but when they first met, they fell head over heels for each other and began dating. Button was particularly besotted with Anderson and eagerly made plans for their future, intending to propose to Anderson when she turned 18. When they bought their fish and chips, they returned to Button's family home to eat. But a fight ensued over a minor misunderstanding, and Anderson left the house. She was shocked at how Button had behaved and began to walk home. Button hopped into his Simca Aronde car and followed her, apologising for the argument and asking her to forgive him and hop into the car. He called, I'm sorry, I apologise. Will you hop in the car and I'll drive you home? No, Anderson refused. She was determined to walk. She walked under a train track subway and disappeared into the darkness. Deciding to give her some space, Button lit a cigarette and let her walk away. He knew that on the other side of the train track subway was a deserted industrial strip where the darkness might make her change her mind. After a few minutes had passed, he put the cigarette out and drove to the other side of the track searching for her. He found her lying in the sand several metres from the road, unconscious and bleeding profusely. Terrified and thinking that there was a hit-and-run driver close by, he hurriedly took Anderson to his car and drove her straight to a doctor's surgery where an ambulance and the police were called to attend. Thirty-one-year-old Lillian and forty-year-old Charles Button lived in Liverpool, England. They had plans to settle down and raise a family together. Charles was a successful hard worker who established a building business in the post-war period. Their wish for a family came true when they welcomed their first daughter, Margaret. A few years later, they welcomed their son, Peter. Then in 1944, along came John, who we will refer to today as Button. When Lillian was 39, their family was finally complete when their fourth child, Jimmy, was welcomed. By 1954, Charles' health had begun to deteriorate, so the family decided to pack up and move to a drier climate relocating to Australia in 1958. By this stage, Button, the third child, had struggled at school, developing a nervous twitch and a stutter. This made him an easy target for bullies. The family decided to send Button and their firstborn Marg to Australia first to be with Charles. After a while, and due to the more relaxed environment in Australia, Button's stutter and nervous twitch almost disappeared, only reappearing 
when he became extremely stressed. Not long after Button and Margaret arrived in Australia, the rest of the family flew over to be reunited and start their new life. Button eventually found work as a bricklayer before he met and fell in love with Anderson. When the police arrived on the scene on the 9th of February 1963, they stayed with Button. They took note of what had happened and questioned the damage to the front right of his car. Button explained that he had a minor collision with a Ford Prefect three weeks earlier, but had not had the time to fix it. Suspicious of Button's response, the police questioned the blood on and inside Button's car. He told them it must have happened when he hurriedly moved Anderson to help her. Not satisfied with Button's responses, the police took him to Central Police Station, where he underwent five hours of questioning. During that time, Button was not given any opportunity to contact anybody, and he was not informed of his rights. The interview became heated, particularly when a police officer accused Button of killing Anderson, which provoked Button into punching the officer. The manner in which the interview was conducted caused Button an overwhelming level of stress and his stutter soon returned. Police suspected the stutter was due to guilty nervousness, despite the fact that he did not deviate from his version of events. It was during the interview that Button was informed Anderson had died of her injuries. He was distraught. He had just lost the love of his life. Desperate to leave the interrogation room, he agreed to sign a confession that had been typed out by a detective. Button believed that the police would soon work out what actually happened. However, after signing the false confession, he was sent straight to jail. Fremantle Prison was ghastly from the outside, but on the inside, it was much, much worse. For three months, Button was held in isolation for 23 hours a day with barely any facilities. He had a bucket to use as his toilet and a mattress on the floor. He was only allowed out of isolation to visit his parents or to speak with his solicitor. The trial ran for six days. The jury was comprised of nine men and three women. Button faced the death penalty for the murder of Rosemary Anderson. Not surprisingly, the Crown relied on the evidence of his signed confession to prove that Button was guilty of the murder of his girlfriend, despite the confession having been obtained under duress. During the trial, Button's lawyer told him not to accuse the police officer of assault as it was unlikely he would be believed, and it would increase the likelihood of him being sentenced to death. Button did not alter his version one iota. He stated consistently that he had found Anderson unconscious on the side of the road and did not play any part in causing her injuries. At the conclusion of the trial, the jury deliberated for two hours before the foreman of the jury declared that they had found Button not guilty of Anderson's murder. The jury was then asked for a verdict on the lesser charge of manslaughter by vehicle impact. The foreman replied that they had found Button not guilty of that charge either. Button breathed an immense sigh of relief. But before anything further happened, in a dramatic and dreadful twist, the foreman called out, wait, wait, I made a mistake, we found him guilty. 
but and looked at the back of his lawyer's head and almost screamed, don't just sit there, say something. But there was only silence. The following day, 19-year-old John Button was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment with hard labour and sent to Fremantle Prison. He worked every day in the carpenter's shop to keep his mind busy. Each afternoon, he returned to his cell, which was locked at 4.30pm every day. There he would have a bowl of soup and a couple of slices of bread. When the lights went out, Button fought an anguished mental struggle, with his mind replaying the events of that fateful night and reminiscing about his times with Rosemary Anderson. Button desperately wanted to appeal, but his lawyers advised him not to. They explained to him that if he appealed his conviction, he could be convicted of murder by the appeal court, thus exposing him to the risk of the death penalty. Months after Button's conviction, Eric Edgar Cook, a 32-year-old father of seven, confessed to having committed eight murders. One of them was the murder of Rosemary Anderson. Cook explained that on the night he had spotted Anderson, she had just walked under the subway. He waited for the traffic to clear before lining her up with the stolen car he was driving, a 1962 Holden. Cook described how, when he hit her, she flew over the bonnet and across the road, then disappeared from his vision. He drove for a short three-kilometre distance before crashing the car into a tree at King's Park to disguise the damage caused by the killing. When Button became aware of Cook's confession, he appealed against his conviction. But, much to his disappointment, the judges refused to believe Cook's confession, deciding that Cook was only trying to delay his execution by making a false confession. The execution was due to be carried out because of his conviction for a separate murder. The major problem with Cook's evidence was that the car he had stolen was fitted with a steel sun visor. The appeal judges queried how a body could have been flung over the top of a car and then displaced well to the left-hand side of the vehicle without either being caught by the visor or ripping it off. Without any further delay, in October of 1964, Cook was hanged. In 1965, a parole system was introduced into Western Australia and serving prisoners were resentenced to give them a parole eligibility date. It was ordered that Button be eligible for parole after serving five years imprisonment. He successfully served his five years without any issues and was released on parole. During his imprisonment and after he was released, Button continued to try to clear his name. In 1998, journalist Brett Christian agreed to publish the biography of Eric Cook for author Estelle Blackburn. The book received wide publicity and detailed new evidence from two witnesses who cast doubt on Button's conviction. The new evidence led to the Western Australian Attorney General agreeing to reopen Button's case and send it back to the appeal courts. The public expectation was that with the new evidence, Button would be exonerated. But the evidence from the two new witnesses was not what was expected 
and did not hold up in court. The original court files included clear photographs of Button's car, which of course had been alleged to have been the murder weapon. One of the world's leading experts on pedestrian crashes, William Haight, was then engaged to review the available evidence. After conducting extensive reviews, Haight found that no firm conclusion could be reached about which car killed the girl. His reason for the indecision was that neither John Button's car nor Cook's car had been crash tested. We'll find out what happened to John Button in next week's podcast. Mm-hmm.